and Dorothy. I'm continuing our series on the family in focus. And if you remember last week, if you weren't here last week, we talked about conflict. Now, if there is one family here that has never had conflict, I want to talk to you because we want to know your secret. But we know that in family life, there is one conflict after another. There's no perfect family. But we're all in process. We're all learning and growing. And whether it's a church family, whether it's an individual family, we're all trying to build a strong family. It takes a lot of work. There's no perfect family. But I want to introduce you to the perfects. Watch this video. Being a parent. 
So who do you go for when you need help? Who do you look to when you need advice? Uh, who is your model? There's only one perfect parent who has ever been perfect in history. Matthew 5, 48, and it's talking about our Heavenly Father. It says, you are to be perfect as your Heavenly Father in heaven is perfect. See, God is the model parent. And the simple secret to effective parenting is to treat your kids the way that God treats you. Uh, he wants, uh, the way that God treats his children is the way that you and I ought to treat our children. So today I want to look at what is God like, what is he about, and then draw some applications to the parenting task. If I'm going to be like my Heavenly Father, then I must understand my children. Look at Psalms 103, verses 13 and 14. It says this, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion passion on those who fear him for he knows how but he knows how we are formed that means that god knows how we tick he knows everything about us and god understands us so if i'm going to be a good parent like god i need to understand my kids again whether you have kids at home whether you have grandkids or whether you're all grown up your kids are all grown up there's something for each one of us you have sermon notes this morning. You're uh, welcome to use those. If they're distraction, just place them off to the side. Here's some things that you'll see. Not only do we need these as, as what our kids need, but you'll find that these same characteristics go in, in what you and I need in this family relationship. These are some things that we need. We need. Your kids need, first of all, understanding. When working in youth ministry for several years, the one thing that I found that kids said that their parents, they struggled with the, the thing that they, they said, my parents don't understand me. There's an issue there because they don't understand me. Proverbs 24.3 from the New Contemporary Version says this. It takes wisdom to have a good family. I want you to underline the rest of this phrase. And it takes understanding to make it strong. God says that is the motivational bottom line. It's the foundation. We have to understand each other. So one of the things we have to do is study our kids. We, we have to know what makes them the way that they are. Every one of us knows that certain children have a unique bent. They have a unique personality and a temperament. If you have more than one child, you'll really know and you understand what I'm talking about. They're all different. They're bit for certain things. They're different as night and day, even though they come from the same family. You can't motivate those kids the same way. They all, they don't have the same strengths. They don't have the, the, the they don't have the same weaknesses, talents, abilities, or even interests. So we shouldn't try to fit them all in the same mold. Proverbs twenty two six. It's a familiar verse. You probably know it by heart. Proverbs 22, 6 is the most misquoted and misunderstood verses in the Bible. Here's what it says. Train a child in the way. Underline those three words. In the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not turn from it. Most people misunderstand this verse to believe that God is somehow making a promise that if you raise your child in the church... That as he gets older, no matter how far he might stray from the faith, as he gets older, that eventually he'll come back. Is that how you understand that verse? I think some of us have understood it that way. But you know what? I know a lot of people who grew up in Christian homes. They were raised in the church, and they are way far from the Lord. And I've known those who have died and never came back to the Lord. So I want us to understand this verse is it's not a promise that if you raise your kids in the church that someday they'll come back. It, it's not a promise. It's a proverb. It's a proverb. The key to understanding this verse is, is this way. The key word is raise a, raise a child in the way. The word way means a style, a temper, a personality. And each child is naturally fitted to go that certain direction. 
The Amplified Version of the Bible says to this verse says it this way. It says, train a child in keeping with his individual gifts or bent. What does that mean? Well, it means that each one of us as parents have to recognize the potential in our kids. Recognize the abilities that they have and encourage them in that direction that they are naturally inclined to go with those talents and their abilities. Uh, that's what that verse means. That's what it means. In other words, if my student child or teenager, if they love English you don't, and they hate math, you don't send them to MIT. I mean, there's a certain way or structure or personality abilities that they have. See, like a woodworker works with the grain, not against the grain. You have to understand your child's natural temperament and work from that understanding to help them grow up as an adult. I have two boys. Uh, they are so different. Personality, they're, they're different. Um, their abilities are somewhat different. They're not from one mold, and I needed to understand that. Uh, and, and they're different. They're just night and day different. We understand that if you have kids. So understanding is a vitally important thing. We have to understand each other. We're not all wired the same. Here's a second thing your kids need. We need acceptance. They need acceptance. There is, you know, the number one thing I think people want in a relationship, in a church relationship, everybody wants to be accepted. Acceptance is vitally important when it comes to our kids. See, God accepts us just the way we are. That's grace. And God wants us to accept our kids or our children just the way they are. And that's grace as well. We have a tendency that when our kids mess up, that's not my kid. You're like your mom. Or my kid says, you're like your dad. You know, when they mess up, you tend to say, you don't look the way I look. You're not meeting my standards, so you kind of, I'm not going to accept you unless you that's what we tend to do. Romans 15, 7 says this. So accept each other. I want you to underline those three words. Accept each other. Just as Christ has accepted you. How has Christ accepted me? How has he accepted you? Just like you are. Now have all this made every choice perfectly? Or have we all done the, the things that we should in life? Absolutely not. But you know what? He still accepts you. We need to accept our kids as a gift from God and not try to make them like us. We need to affirm their uniqueness. See, we tend to send out signals as parents and we say, you need to be just like me. You need to be interested in the things that I'm interested in. You need to do good in school just like I did. You need to be an athletic, you need to be good at athletics like I was. And what we're really doing is saying we don't recognize or appreciate the unique way that God has made you. And subtly it says to our kids, they think, well, if I've got to be accepted by mom and dad, I've got to do, I can't be myself. I've got to be like mom and dad. <coughs> the only way to get acceptance in this house is through performance. And I've got to be, I've got to be like my parents in order to be accepted. So we need to accept our kids just like they are. Just accept them. I know it's really hard to separate accepting a child or accepting another person when they're not like we would like them to be. Or especially when they're not doing what we approve of. Friends, how many of us have been there? You don't like the behavior, but you love the person. Accept the person just like they are, and let God work through them. But it's hard. It's a, it's a fine thing. So understand and accept everyone right where they're at and whatever's going on. Here's the third one. Uh, your kids need discipline. Your kids need discipline. Hebrews 12, verse 6, says this. It says, For the Lord, the Lord disciplines those he loves. I want you to underline the Lord disciplines those he loves. Because that's a sign from God. When you're being disciplined, and nobody likes discipline, especially from the Lord, but when it comes, we need to understand that it's because God loves you that he disciplines us. 
See, when I discipline my kids that God has given me, I'm showing them that I love them. Here's Proverbs 13, 24 is what it says. It says, if you refuse to discipline your children, it proves you don't love them. If you love your children, you would be prompt to discipline them. You know, if I just let them get away with anything, it shows that I really don't care enough about them. It shows that I'm helping them walk down a path of, of destruction. You say, well, how could that be? Proverbs 19.18 says this. Discipline your children while there is hope. And then underline the rest of that verse. If you don't, you will ruin their lives. We have a responsibility to discipline our children because we love them and we care deeply about them. It's, for, it's important for us to understand there's a difference between discipline and punishment. The purpose of punishment is to inflict a penalty, but the purpose of discipline is to promote growth. The focus of punishment is on the past. The focus of discipline is on the future. The attitude of the parent when you're punishing, it's anger. But the motivation behind discipline is love. See, the Bible says that God punishes the wicked for those who reject it. It's punishment. But it says that he disciplines his own children. I don't spank the, the I don't spank the neighbor's kids and God doesn't mess with the devil's kids, but he does discipline his own children. You know what in life sometimes we get spanked. You know that spanking is biblical? Right, I'm not going to get in a big discussion because it's like you talk about spanking. It's like a uh, political incorrect. But spanking is biblical. God uniquely designed these little back ends in certain areas with some extra padding that, you know, nothing's going to get hurt. But let me say this. Never, never discipline in anger. You discipline in love. You discipline in love. What's the result? The result of its punishment, you're going to bring about fear, you're going to bring about guilt, and you're going to bring out more anger. The result of discipline is this. Discipline brings security. I feel secure because when there's discipline, it shows that there's perimeters and there is boundaries in my life. I remember, and again, whether you're a parent dealing with kids right now or even a grandparent, you say as a grandparent, I'm going to let my kids do the disciplining. I agree. I mean, it has to be a, a mom or a dad saying to grandpa or grandma, you have, go right ahead and discipline. That You have to get permission, I, I believe. But I remember being at my grandpa's, my mom's mom and dad, grandpa and grandma friends. Grandpa said, Les, I was old enough to know what was going on. He says, quit walking on the couch. Guess what I did? Kept walking on the couch. He said, Les, Stop walking on that couch. I didn't listen to him. He'd come over, pop me out of my behind. You know what? Never walked on the couch again. Now, did Grandpa do that in anger? Absolutely not. I'm glad that Grandpa said there are boundaries and perimeters, and you're going past those. It helped me as a young child to understand there are certain perimeters. And I need that. We all need that. It gave security for parameters and boundaries in my life. Here's some things if you're going to discipline, real quickly, do it calmly. Do it calmly. Uh, how many times, and we have, how many times have you disciplined or spanked your kids, not because you were disciplining them, but you were frustrated? God says, don't do it when you're frustrated. Uh, don't ever discipline in your anger. Proverbs 29, 11 says, a fool gives full vent to his anger. But a wise person quietly holds it back. Discipline should be calm. Very calm. Uh, here's the next thing. Do it quickly. Uh, do it right now. <coughs> Don't delay. Don't say, wait till your father gets home. You do it quickly. Now, I know that my mom, dad was always out, and mom was a stay-at-home mom. My mom did some disciplining. Until we got to that certain age when we would get our, our discipline, on the back side, and we'd, we'd laugh. Because we were big enough that it's like, it's not working. And we would laugh, and then mom would start laughing, and you know what? She did say, well, wait till your dad gets home. So that was a little bit more worried. worried. I was more worried about that. 
but do it quickly. Don't delay. And here's the next one. Do it sparingly. Do it sparingly. See, because you get more effect if you don't do it all the time. My son, Mason, bless his heart, I think he was my strong-willed son. Uh, maybe he's the most like me when I was a kid. But I, I was going to stick with it when it came to discipline. I was going to stick with it. But sometimes I think I did it too often. And you don't want to do it too often. You know why? Because Colossians 3.21 says this. Fathers, don't aggravate your children. If you do, they will become discouraged and quit trying. You just don't need to do it too often, but do it on purpose. See, don't discipline kids for just being kids. You discipline, you discipline them for rebellion, and there's a big difference. If they're kids, they're going to spill milk. You don't discipline for spilled milk. It's going to happen. They're kids, and if you're trying to make them be adults when they're kids, that's the wrong attitude. It's you, you discipline when they are rebellious. I remember in about fourth grade, I come home, it was a Sunday afternoon, and we're sitting at the table, my dad's at the head, I'm at the other end, and mom and dad, my uh, two brothers at the side, and we started eating the Sunday meal, and dad said, let's have a Sunday school. Okay. We talked a little bit, he says, hey, Les, I, I need you to go to your room. I knew I was in trouble. Because that morning, in Sunday school, I tried to make it fun and laugh and all that, and I was very disruptive. My dad came in the room, he told me what was going on, and I knew. But my dad lovingly disciplined me. And it wasn't fun, believe me. But you know what? He taught me respect for other people. You don't disrespect other people. And I'm glad that out of love, he disciplined. We all need that at times. Here's the next one. In your sermon notes, everyone, all kids, need love. The Bible gives some examples of God's love for children. And there are three ways in which we can express love to our kids that they're going to understand. Here's the first one. How about affection? Affection is physical contact. It's hugs and kisses. It's pats on the back. Now, I want you to understand that there does come a time in which you back off because you're a little bit older and the hugs and kisses aren't the best thing to do. We do that really well when we're young. But I want to say, you know, I'm going to be 48 years old on Friday, and I still love affection from my mom and my dad. I'm an affectionate person. I know not everybody is, but affection, a handshake, a look in the eye says, I care about you and I love you. We need that. We need affection. Uh, Psalms 145.9 says this, The Lord, He is good to all, but He has compassion on all He's made. See, God is affectionate with you and me. I hope that you sense and know His love. He went on the cross for you because He loved you so much. He laid it all down for you that you can have life. God is affectionate. Now, studies have shown that fathers, us men, are one-sixth as physically affectionate towards our kids as moms. So guys, we have to work harder to be more affectionate to our kids. Show love to your kids. Show affection for them. Show that you care. doesn't matter if they're grown up or not. We all need affection. Here's the next one. How about showing them affirmation is a way to express love. Psalms 145.14 says this. The Lord helps the fallen and lifts up those bent beneath the their loads. You know, life is tough. It's tough on the kids these days. It's tough on your grown-up kids. They need your affirmation day in and day out. We shape our kids by the way we talk to them all the time. Do you talk down to your kids? Or do you talk to them, uh, you know, do you build them up or tear them down? The way that we talk and, aff and affirm, the way that we build them up instead of tearing them down is vitally important. How do you talk to your kids? <coughs> Don't make fun of your kids. I mean, it's all right to have fun and joking, but do not put them down. Build them up and encourage them. I want homes to be a place where people can come in and not fear failure. They're not going to fear. It's okay if you fail as long as you try. I want to be a family to be a place where kids can come home and say, you know what, school today, I blew it. I tried. But I blew it, and they're not put down because they gave an effort. They gave their very best. 
They're loved and they're built up. And their empty tank and, and their empty tank of self-esteem is refilled. We need to create an environment where it's okay to fail and still get affirmed. We need that in our homes, and you know what? We need that in the church, where you're affirmed and not put down. Everybody, it's real easy when your child gets straight A's to say, oh, way to go. You know, when they hit the home run, hey, way to go. When they win that contest, we're, we're really quick to affirm them. That, what about the time when they lose? What about the time they fail and they fall flat on their face? You didn't meet my expectations or my standards. Are you going to build them up? Or tear them down. We all need words of affirmation. In our family home, in our church home, no matter what age we are, we all need affirmation. There's a third way to express love, and that is attention. That's attention. That's probably the number one way that kids feel loved is by spending time with them. Psalms 145.18 says, The Lord is close to all who call on him. That's basically implying attention. I want you to know that God is here for you. He has his attention on you. But so many times in life we have absent fathers. They're not around. At Cornell University did a little study. They said this. They attached microphones like I have here. They attached them on the kids and they monitored these kids, monitored them for weeks. And here's what they found. They found that in America, the average father spends on a day per basis only 37.7 seconds talking to the children. And yet we spend hours upon hours watching TV. So where are our kids getting their values? Where are our kids learning about God? See, families have to spend some time together because we're going in many different directions. And if I'm going to be like my Heavenly Father, I've got to give attention, I've got to give affection, and I need to give affirmation in a way that my child, or son, or daughter, or even grandkids understand. And here's the last one. Consistency. Consistency. That's what our kids do. The Lord is righteous, it says in Psalms 145, 17. The Lord is righteous in everything that he does. Everything that he does, he does it perfectly. He is perfectly consistent in his character. And he displays this in every situation. If you haven't discovered this yet, let me tell you that in your home, especially if you have kids, I want you to know that your house is bugged. Now you say, no, I'm not talking about little insects. I'm talking about they're going to pick up everything you have. It's bugged. They're picking up everything you say. You're never off record. Never. Uh, Jacob, my little grandson, is picking up things. Uh, Trent would stick his tongue out like that. And Jacob's starting to do that. We Skyped yesterday just for a moment. And guess what? I'm on the screen. I'm going, guess what Jacob did? He saw me, and he did the same thing. He's picking it up. There's never anything they're not picking up. So the kids are watching you. They're watching what you say. They're watching how you talk on the phone. They're watching how you react and respond to your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, your neighbor. They are always watching. And you know what? We need, no matter where we are in the process, to continue to teach by the way of our example, by being consistent. Live a consistent life before your children. Live a consistent life before other people, and you'll be well on your way in this process of life. I say this in closing. I wish there were some things that I could do to go back and change some things that I did early in my, when my kids were young. And you know full well that you can't go back. <laughs> None of us can. You can't go back to yesterday, but today you can say, I'm going to do everything I can to build into my family, to make us a strong family. Because every family is in process. We're all at different stages, no matter how old our kids are, and we all need these particular things in our lives. It goes by so quickly. You're still a family, but things have changed. Parenting isn't for cowards. And I would say this as I did last week. No matter what you're going through, no matter how many struggles you have in your family, I want you to know that Jesus is here to help you, to comfort you, and to strengthen you. If you don't know Jesus, I tell you he is the cornerstone and the foundation. I encourage you to invite him into your life, into your family. 
But I know as well, many of you have accepted Christ. But you know what? We need to maybe come and say, Lord, I know I'm still in process, and I need your help because it's very hard to raise kids in these days. You may have grown kids that are having struggles. And maybe you want to pray for them today that as they're teaching their children, that they're raising uh, their kids uh, in the right way. Let us stand together and sing number 484 of the closing song. If you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I invite you to come to be a part of his family. But maybe you need help today in raising your